be equipped and prepared for that move. And and that song is just it, it it always grabs a hold of me. Just saying, Lord, whatever you're doing, don't do it without me. And God is saying, I'm I'm not trying to leave you, but you're not ready. I gave you the chance. I I I gave you the time. I gave you what you needed to be ready, but for some reason you were not prepared, and 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 you did not take advantage of of what it was that I have given you in order for you to go along with this move. So it's not that I'm moving without you. You just couldn't come along. So this is what we're going to be dealing with today in, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. And, and today we're going to talk about gift divation. Gift divation. Father God, we come before you right now, Lord, just thanking you for this time, oh God. Thanking you for your move, O oh God, and we just pray, Lord, that you will remove me out of the way, O oh God, that what you have given me, O oh God, will edify your people on today, that we might be ready for the move that you have. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Those of you who know me well know that the English language is not adequate for me, <laughs> which forces me to have to create my own words. Amen. They made words. Why can't I make words? Who is Webster? <laughs> gift evasion. But this is something that you're going to have to take this with you. I, so we might need to call Webster and get this added because this right here is, is going to be crucial uh, for us moving on into the next level of our lives. As we are, our, our focus this year with this church is moving forward, pressing toward the mark, you're not going to be able to go forward without gift evasion. I'm going to spell it for y'all. And Brother Dennis, because you're going to put it on. Had to put it on the CD. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's get this right. Gift evasion. It's really simple. G I F T. Somebody need to write this now. E V A T I O N. Gift evasion. I'm going to give you all a definition for you. No, one more time. Start again. G I F. Y'all got to get this. Y'all got to get this. I'm telling you, y'all got to get this. G-I-F-T-E-V-A-T-I-O-N. Gift evasion. And this is what gift evasion, gift, gift evasion is. It's when the parameters of one's life is elevated solely because of their gift. When the parameter of one's life is elevated solely because of their gift, gift evasion. This is what's going on here in Proverbs 18, 16, where it pens, a man's gift maketh room for him and brings him before great men. In life, we see rappers, we see singers, we see actors and, and athletes. We see their lives change in a moment solely because of their gift. The singer, the rapper just needs one hit song and he can go or she can go and perform this song forever. I swear a few years ago I saw a Vanilla Ice book somewhere. <laughs> He's still doing Ice Ice Baby. Actors still, actors only need one breakout role. They do one great role and mess around and get an Oscar, right? After that, their life has changed. They are elevated. Now they're asking for 10 and 20 millions all because of their gift. But this is really epitomized in, in sports on an NBA or NFL draft night. You see these young guys who are normally from impoverished places and, and haven't had much, and they are looking forward to this draft because they know that what they've done, their gift put them in a place 
where once they get drafted, their life is going to change immediately. The things that they, they couldn't do before, they will be able to do now. The, the, the things that they wanted to do that they couldn't do, they, could, they couldn't take care of their mom. Then they're talking about buying their mom a house and a car and another house and another car because they got millions and instantly their life has changed solely because of their gift. Now, I'm not implying that giftivation is instant success, but that following your gift will lead to success. And understand that success does not always mean you're going to be a multimillionaire because uh, the idea of success in America has been totally skewed. They put everything on it in dollar signs, and if you don't make a certain amount, you're not successful. But success is just uh, to, to come to a desired end. So whatever you set out to do, if you do it and you, and you accomplish it, you are successful. And in the kingdom of God, all we're trying to do is what God called and purposed us to do in the first place. The only thing we're really trying to do, or the only thing we should be trying to do, might I say, is what it is that God has gifted us to do is what it is that God preordained and selected us and empowered us to do. And as we do that, that means we are successful because we're doing what we were created for. There are people who are billionaires who are unsuccessful because what they were supposed to be doing in life, they're not doing not what God created you for, but because the world places all its emphasis and all its, all, all, its, all its merits on money, that's where everybody is looking for success or, or what can make you rich, but nobody's trying to do what they were created for. I know I don't want to have a product to do something and it doesn't do what I wanted to do. It's, it's it doesn't make sense. And, and, and that's what God, God is saying to us, I created you for a particular purpose. But you got to get in tune with what I created you for in order for your life to be success. As the Tony was just talking about, God saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's going to be a sad day with some billionaires who never got in touch with Jesus Christ, never got in touch with their gift, never got in touch with the kingdom of God, come before Jesus the Christ, and he says, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Get away from me. Because only what you do for Christ will last. A man's gift maketh room for him. First things first, are you aware that you are gifted? I'm not asking you, do you know what your gift is, but do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that before you were born, God had already gifted you with something? Uh, so many people were walking around sad and depressed, hopeless, purposeless, feeling like they can never get ahead, and those thoughts are coming because they don't know their gift. If they knew that they were gifted, they would know that there's a way for them to get ahead in life, but they got to get in tune with it. The fact that you are gifted means God put something inside of you that will cause you to be elevated, that to take you to every place where you're supposed to go. But when you're not in tune with your gift, when you're not in tune with the Spirit of God, when you're not in tune with the move of God, you're going to feel unsuccessful, you're going to feel hurt, you're going to feel purposeless, you're going to feel like you can't ever get ahead because it's your gift that gets you ahead. In this world, majority of the time, people are only great at one thing. Some people might be great at more than one, but majority of people are great at one thing. They could be the worst at everything in the world, but find peace and, and solace and meaning in life in the one thing that they're great at. The one thing that they're great at, they grab a hold, they spend all their time uh, doing, they they think about it, they study it, they practice it and work on it, and, 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 and they hold that one thing, and they allow that one thing to take them to another level. As I just was talking about the athletes, they just play basketball or football or whatever it is. Some of them graduate college and, and, and really didn't get a degree, really didn't learn too much. All they were focused on was sports because they knew if I can just focus on this, this is going to give me what that degree couldn't. <laughs> if I just focus on the gift that God ha 
that has put inside of me already, it's going to give me what nothing in this world can give me because the gift of God puts me in a place where nothing else matters, where nothing else has any meaning, where nothing else is on my, on, on my priority list because all I want is to be where God wants me to be. Now, what we are challenged to do is find our gift. And stop thinking about the things that we can't do for it's in the one thing that you can do that will elevate your life. It's in that one thing that God put in you that if you take time to mold will take you to where you need to be in life. Will take you to where you want to be. Will, will take you to where God wants you. It's in that one thing. But we don't take the time to listen and hear from God in order to receive and understand and to know what we're gifted at. So we are challenged to search the scriptures. We are challenged to sit in prayer. And by prayer, I don't mean talking. I mean listening and resting in the power of God and, and hearing from the Holy Spirit. If we take that time for God to begin to show us what we're gifted at, and once we find that gift, find solace in that. But you got to know that you're gifted. Don't let the world tell you anything other. Don't let the world's idea of success deter you from wanting to be what God called you to be. Because, see, once you know you have a gift, you can then begin to visualize where it can take you. Once you understand what you can do, you can look at that and say, if I do this in an excellent way, that can take me here. As a business major, we're trained and, and taught to be able to look at anything and figure out how to market it and make some money off of it. When I'd be back in, in, the, in, my, in my old neighborhood, I'd be talking to the young guys, and I'd be talking to them and trying to get them, you know, out of the street life. So one day I just started talking to them. I said, listen, I said, everything around you, there is a multimillionaire off of. So I just start pointing at the hug cartons on the ground, the potato chip bags, the glass and the windows, the towel around the windows, the bricks, the roofing, everything. There's somebody that took some time to work on that one thing and it elevated their life. But see, if we could visualize what, where this gift could take us, once you understand that God did give me something, then I can work on that one thing. Sometimes we can never be elevated because we will never feel as if we are worthy. We never feel that we have an ability. We never feel like we have the knowledge, the capability. We don't think there's nothing about us that can ever be at this level. But God has given each and every one of us a gift, and your gift will make room for you. When I was in middle school, in fifth grade I was in one school and then I went, I got transferred, I went to another school. When I got to that school, I took a bunch of tests and I scored really high on the test. So at first I was in, I was in one class and then they, they took me out of that class and put me in the other class which they call prime classes. And these classes were for gifted children. This is before I got stupid. <laughs> they used to be very smart. They put me in, 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 in the prime class, the class that's for all the gifted kids. And, and they separated us from the other classrooms. They, they separated us from the other classmates in order to put all of us in one class that we can all hone in on our giftedness. Uh, sometimes we're trying to figure out why God is separating us from the people that we've always been around, and we're trying to figure out why God is taking us from the places that we've always been at. Been at. But God is trying to get you in a place where you can hone in on your gift. Because, see, if we would have stayed in the classroom with the kids who did not care, with the kids that did not want to study, the kids who didn't care about getting A's, and the kids that were fighting and talking, they would have been a distraction to us. And that distraction would have been messing with our gift because we're, we're trying to get a hold, hold in on our gift, but they're not. So sometimes God will begin to remove people from your life just because they're distracting you from finding out your giftedness. A 
A man's gifts make us room for him. Now, the one problem with what the school board was doing, because eventually they, they got rid of the prime classes, uh, the problem was these classes began to imply that the other children weren't gifted. And sometimes those type of things can stick with you the rest of your life. You, you were young and these kids are gifted, you're not. They're in the prime class, the gifted class, you're not. And then you grow up with that stigma in your mind that all my life those were the gifted kids and and I was not gifted. So now, once we become blood-wise believers and we become a part of the kingdom, the question becomes, can you still believe God after you were put in the not gifted box? Can you break out of, I'm not gifted because they said I wasn't gifted, when God begins to tell you, I did put a gift inside of you? So often we can't grab a hold of the principles of the kingdom because we got so much worldly stuff in our mind. And that's why we got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind because our earthly mind is never going to receive the things of God. God is telling you not only that you are gifted, but that you were gifted before you were even born. But the world told you that you're not gifted. Now you're in the church saying, that can't be me. God is calling me to do what? How, how, how can he call me to do that? I'm, I'm not gifted. But the, I love the word because it shows us all these people that the world did not deem gifted, who became great people of God. I love the story of David when God sent Samuel and, and to, to anoint David, and he has to have a pep talk with him and says, don't look at him for his height. <laughs> Don't, 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 listen, Samuel, he's not going to look like a king when you get there, Samuel. He's not going to look like a king. Man looks on the outside. I, I, I look on the inside. I know what's in him. Don't get there and start looking on the outer appearance because I know what's in him. And this is what God has said to each and every one of us. I know what's in you. Because I put it inside of you. I put a gift that's inside of you that if you would just tap into, but see, you got to get those other things out of your mind. Can you stare your past in the face? Can you stare what they told you in the face? Can you stare your doubts in the face? Can you stare your fear in the face and say, I am gifted and my gift is going to make room for me? It's a popular thing to get in where you fit in. I'm not trying to find a place where I fit. My gift is going to make room for me to fit. Last year, the Cleveland Cavaliers had a starting small forward. Truthfully, I have no idea what his name is. But in this offseason, LeBron James decided that he's going to take his gift back to Cleveland. LeBron is not going to ask them if If they have an extra small forward spot for him, his gift is going to demand. <laughs> his level of giftedness is going to demand the spot that's there. doesn't matter who there. I don't know who he is. LeBron probably don't even know who he is. But LeBron's gift is not going to ask, it's their space. But because of his giftedness, it's going to make room for him on the roster. Somebody going to have to go. Somebody going to have to sit the bench because my gift is making room for me. When the children of Israel went to the promised land, God began to talk to them and tell them, I gave you homes that you didn't build and, and gardens that you didn't plant. See, that I, I made room for y'all in the promised land. I took y'all to a place where people were and gave it to y'all all because y'all was gifted. I made room, and God is going to make room for each and every one of us, but it's according to your gift. It's according to your gift. A man, his gift 
make it room for him. And this language is possessive. The gift in question belongs solely to the individual. There might be somebody that's gifted in a similar fashion as you are, but nobody has your exact gift. There are many other people who are gifted to preach, but don't nobody preach like me. Now, I'm not saying that bragging, nor from a place of superiority, but we need to know that God has given us all something that nobody else can do. See, you got to know that there's something special about you. And that's why when you get in tune with your gift, it will elevate you because you then become a phenomenon. You become something that nobody else has ever seen before because your gift is, is one of a kind, a, a man's gift, his gift, not this gift that we give to each man, but that man or that woman's gift, that individual person's gift that was created and shaped just for them. When you get in touch with something that nobody else can, it will take you places because nobody saw before. Whenever a new invention comes out, it blows up. Most of the time. Sometimes it ain't no good. But the fact that you never saw it before, I'm going to buy that. Not that anybody's going to buy us, but that's, that's what we begin to bring to the world when we get in tune with our individual gift. We begin to bring to the world something that they never saw, something that they've never experienced. They might experience something similar. They're like, there are people that can sing, and they can sing good, but then there's somebody else that gives you a whole other experience. Now, I like this genre. Oh, but I love this genre also. Oh, I love this genre. I love everything because they're bringing me something different. The first time I preached, everybody here was going crazy. Not because I was so good, but because it was me. <laughs> Dang. It was, I had, first of all, I had just got saved in June, and I preached in October. So everybody was amazed because this fool? <laughs> but the fact that I got in tune with my gift caused everybody to recognize it. And that was a young adult Friday night service that I preached. But then two weeks later, pastor called me and said, I need you to preach Sunday morning. Scared the death out of me. But when you get in tune with your gift, the people that have the power to cause you to utilize it will be forced to see you. See, had I never begun to study and, and, and do that young adult service, pastor and co-pastor wouldn't have heard me preach that Friday night to cause me to preach on a Sunday and then ultimately become a minister. But because I began to get in tune with my gift, it caused the people who had the power to put me in a certain place to see what it was that I could do and then say, well, you can go ahead to do it. There are some people that have the power to put you in whatever place that God has already ordained for you to be in, but they will never see you if you don't operate in your gift. But on the flip side of it, if you operate in your gift, it's going to put you in a place where they got to see you. A man's gift. Make it room. Now we're forced to deal with the fact that it's not you. It's the gift. Come on now. Come on. It's, it's not you that they love. It's the gift. It's not you that they cheer for. It's the gift. It's not you that they hate. It's the gift. It, it, it's, it's your gift that make it room. And, and we got to understand that it's a gift and not us. Uh, too often are we, do we spend more time on trying to create opportunities than we do preparing to be equipped for one. Ooh. 
I could be running around to every mega church handing out my business card, trying to preach in arenas, 10,000 seats. But I haven't prepared to preach for a church with 10 seats. They're not going to they're not going to put me in a, in, a, in a place to do that if I haven't already prepared my gift. If I haven't already worked on my gift. If I haven't already been honing in on my gift. And I'm trying to get out here and create all these opportunities, but you can't create opportunities that your gift can. Once you get in tune with the gift, it's the gift that makes room. You watch any singing competition show. One thing you'll see or you'll hear on each and every one of them is you can sing, but you're not ready for this. Come back and try out next year. Which translates to we acknowledge that you have a gift, but you need to work on it. And in order for you to get on this stage, you got to go back and work on your gift. In order for you to get on this level, you got to go back and work on your gift. In order for you to get elevated, you got to go back and work on your gift. And I saw shows where people have came back the next year and got further because they went back and practiced on their gift. And we are finding ourselves in places where we want to get elevated. And God is saying, I sent you back to work on your gift. Have you? Have you spent any time making your gift work? Have you spent any time learning about it? Have you spent any time studying on it? Have you spent any time with somebody else that operates in that gift? What have you done that I should elevate you? But once, but once you begin to work on it, the elevation will soon follow. But if, if the text teaches us that the gift is what makes the room, how can it do it if it's not strong enough? How, how can your gift begin to break down barriers if you haven't even exercised or, or worked the gift? I don't know about how other preachers prepare, but I preach my message before I preach my message. I'm called to come here to preach, not to come here to study. So when I'm home, I'm preaching it. I know where I'm going to be calm at. I already know where my voice is going to be elevated. If I could hoop, I would know where I was going to hoop at. <laughs> Even with praise and worship, I don't just come up here. I practice before I get here. I got, I, I'm prepared before I do the act that needs to be done. And, you know, I always had this nightmare, and it scares me to death. I always have a nightmare that I'm preaching, and I get up, and I don't have no notes, and I can't remember nothing. Like, I didn't study, I didn't prepare, and I'm like, what am I going to do? And it's so scary, like, y'all ain't preachers, y'all don't understand. It's just so scary, like, all of y'all waiting for a word, and I don't got nothing. And that it just always makes me know that I need to continually work on my gift. I need to continually be in my word. I need to be continually learning. So that's what I do. When I, when I have to preach, I study. When I don't have to preach, I study. I begin to put together messages in my head when I have to preach and when I don't have to preach. I watch preachers on YouTube. I watch preachers on the Word Network. I listen to preachers. I go to other services of preachers that I like to hear preachers. Because if I'm going to be the best preacher that I can be, I need to know what good preaching looks like. Now, we begin to look at people who are operating at a certain level and sometimes get jealous. But looking at somebody operating in their level should not make you desire to be better than them. It should make you want to be better than you. So every time I might listen to a message from, from pastor or if I'm on YouTube, I listen to T.D. Jakes, I'm not trying to preach better than them. I'm trying to preach better than I preached last time. But I'm taking some notes. I'm trying to figure out how they prepared. I'm trying to figure out how they looked in the text and saw that in order for me to have my gift. And as I've been doing that, my gift has been making room for me. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. This this Hebrew word bringeth is nakah, which is also translated as lead. It's the same word where in Exodus, when it says that God went before them by day as a pillar of cloud 
and led them the way. So this cloud that was leading them was leading them to the promised land. In the same way, your gift, it's the same word here, in the same way your gift leads you to where you are destined to be. It bringeth forth, it, it leads, it opens up the space, and it takes you. But our problem is we don't let our gift lead. We don't let our gift be the vehicle in which that's going to take us somewhere. Have you ever gotten to a car with somebody and they brought you somewhere? All you did was get in the car and they took you. And what God is trying to tell us through this verse is you need to dig so deep into your gift that it's like you're getting into a car and the gift is just going to take you to the place where it's supposed to take you at. But we're trying to tell the gift, no make a left, no slow down, no speed up, no make a right, no take a U-turn. No, I know a better way, gift. But God is saying, no, just get in tune with your gift. Keep working on your gift. And as you start to work on your gift, your gift will just begin to know all the right directions. And your gift will then begin to take you to where it is that you are supposed to be in life. Just recently, God had to deal with me about that. Because financially, I'm not where I, I want to be. And as you know, I recently just wrote a book. And as I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business major. I've been a planner all my life. So I came to a place where I said, you know what, I'm getting ready to, I'm going to put together a marketing campaign and plan for my book in order for me to get this thing out there so I can make a bunch of money, right? But something just didn't feel right. It didn't, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't sit well with my spirit to do this plan. So I said, I'm going to pray. So I began to pray, and I was in prayer maybe 30 seconds, and God just said, just do ministry. He said, just do ministry. Just do what you're gifted to do. And I'm going to take care of the rest. Don't get out there and, and, and try to get booked as a vendor here and a, and a vendor there. And uh, don't try to get your book put here. And, and don't try to do all these marketing strategies to get the success that you want in your natural mind. Just keep working on your gift. And I'm going to open it up. So I said amen. So I'm, li I'm, I'm living this out. Right now, as, as I preach this, and that's why this is, is so convicting to me, because I see the elevation. Because I see, I'm getting the emails to come preach here, and I'm getting the phone calls to come here, and, and, and people want me to be a part of this, and they want me to be a part of that. Stuff that I, know, I didn't apply for, I didn't ask nobody, but people heard. So it's my gift. That as I continue to work on my gift and preach the way I'm supposed to preach and do it the way God called me to do it, that people are beginning to hear and people are beginning to call because my gift is making room and it's taking me. But this makes me just think about different things. And I began to think about Moses. And I began to think and, and I asked, what was it that caused Moses to float down our river, which which killed so many other Hebrew boys. But when Moses got in it, he, he floated into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter and ultimately into the palace. But the text tells us when his mother saw him, she saw that he was a goodly child, so she hid him. So I then began to think, well, what was different about Moses than the rest of the Hebrew boys? We're talking about a newborn baby that didn't have time to do anything to cause his mother to view him in a certain way. Whatever she saw in him was not from his own actions or something that he earned, but something that was gifted to him. She saw a gift in her child, a gift that would lay dormant for 80 years. And too often we begin to feel like because so much time has elapsed that I can never walk into what God had called me to do because I, I'm too old. God, God, God wanted me to go this direction in my career, but I'm, I'm too old to go back to school in and, and, and order to do it. But, 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 but Moses had a gift that lay dormant for 80 years before he walked in it. His mother looked at him and she saw a gift. A gift that caused the Pharaoh to be to despise Moses while they were growing up. 
And so often we have people that we can't figure out why they don't like us. But as I said earlier, people don't like you because they feel and see your gift. Your gift begins to threaten them. And, 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 and the Pharaoh knew that Moses had the power to end up taking over. The Pharaoh probably could see it before Moses could even see it because the enemy knows your gift better than you. That's why the enemy begins to attack you because he's trying to keep you from your gift. Moses' mom saw a gift at him that was seemingly overlooked by his speech impediment. And how many of us have some sort of impediment or something that we think is keeping us back? That even when God came to Moses and told him what he would be, Moses said, but I can't speak good. What is it that is keeping you from your gift? What is, what, what is the equivalent of your speech impediment? That you keep saying, God, it's no way I can be that because of this. Whatever that is, God is saying, you forget all about that. My gift trumps that. My gift is greater than that. My anointing will break that. Because Moses, in the beginning, did not want to speak. In fact, he had Aaron doing all the speaking for him. But as Moses got in tune with God, by the time we got from the book of Exodus to Deuteronomy, Moses is giving a long speech because he got in tune. What's his gift? And this is the crux of everything that we're dealing with today that I really want you to take home with. Moses' mom put him in a river. His gift put him in a pile. Moses' mom put him in a river that symbolized death, a river that was the place where they were to throw all the Hebrew boys in order to kill him. His mom put him in that river, but his gift took him through that river right into a palace. And so many of us might have been placed into some places. What, what is your river? I might not know. Only, only you know what your river is. What place have you been put in that has been designed to kill you, that has been designed to keep you down, that has been designed to keep you from ever being what God already called you to be, but God is letting you know that your gift, even if you are placed in that place, your gift will take you to where you're supposed to be because your gift will make room and will bring you. Your gift will make room and will lead you. Your gift will make room and will take you. It does not matter where you were placed. It does not matter where you are from. It does not matter whose family you come from. It does not matter what social class you are. It does not matter what race you are. It does not matter what sex you are. It does not matter if nobody wants to talk to you. It's no matter if nobody wants to hire you. It does not matter what your river is, your gift will take you. Your gift will make room and take you. Your gift. When you feel stuck. Does anybody feel stuck? This is what God is saying. When, when, when you're stuck, we're stuck, we're in a tight place. We can't move. We can't go forward, backwards, to the left, to the right, and we're stuck. And he's saying, your gift makes room. Begins to give you a little wiggle room. You get in tune with your gift. And your gift, see what it says, it, it makes it, that means it enlarges or it increases your gift. The, see, the space that you couldn't get out of your gift, if you just get in tune with your gift where you couldn't go, if you just get in tune with your gift where you couldn't walk, if you just get in tune with your gift where you weren't invited, hallelujah, the places that were not let you come in when you asked will then begin to invite you to come in. Your gift, if you get in tune with your gift, I don't care if you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, your gift will become to be a demolition man for you. I don't care where you're stuck at, your gift will begin to make room for you and will bring you to where you are destined to be. But will you get in tune with your gift? And God is trying to put us all in the process of gift 
You will be elevated because of your gift if you take the time to hone in on your gift. And Jesus came, the Bible says that when Jesus ascended after he was crucified and after he rose again, the Bible says that Jesus, when he ascended, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He led captivity captive. Therefore, there's no such thing as captivity. Unless you give something the power to hold you captive. But once you have the knowledge, you can break free of whatever it is. Because Jesus led captivity captive. But he gave gifts to men. Are you connected to the gifts that he left? Are you connected to him? Those gifts... Uh, that, 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 that he left were, were for believers. Well, they are for everybody, but you can't get in tune with them without Jesus. Because we're all born with the gift. Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. We're, we were all born with the gift, but we got to get in tune with him in order to properly know how to function with the gift. We buy appliances, and if something goes wrong, what do we do? call the manufacturer so they can tell us better how to operate in this thing. So today God is speaking to each and every one of us saying, I gave you a gift. I gave you a gift that will elevate your life. But you got to get in tune with me in order to understand how to operate it. Let us all stand.